Thanks, Dustin. All right. Um, so I'm going to do something that I've never done at like a regular conference before, which is to say I'm going to do a live coded talk intentionally as opposed to accidentally, which has happened a few times. Um, and uh, what we are going to do is we're going to derive the free monad. We're going to do it together. Um, because I think, honestly, this is, the, this is the best way to actually understand what's going on, right? I mean, I, I think we've all seen, like, you know, random tutorials or, like, the CATS documentation page or things like that where people talk about, well, you know, here's what you can do with the free monad and look, isn't this cool and, like, testing and yay, and, like, interpreters and, you know, natural transformations and all that, all that stuff, right? We, we've all seen all of that. Um, but at, at some point, like, there's just too much magic, right? Like, you, you actually want to see, like, what is going on? Can I actually, like, you know, understand what is happening here? Um, and I think if, uh, if all goes as planned, we will all understand that, okay? So what I want to approach this as is um, uh, I want to see if we can create a monad, so define the monad type class um, for any type constructor. Okay, now to be clear what I mean by type constructor, I'm gonna like shift this screenshot, right? So let me make ourselves Scala, right? Uh, that is not the right command. Uh, Scala, all right. Um, so what I mean by type constructor is like, you know, foo of a equals da 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 right? This, so foo, foo is a type constructor. It's a type constructor that takes a single parameter. So what I want to do is I want to define a monad for any type constructor, no restrictions. Doesn't have to be option, it could just be like didgeridoo of A or something like that that has like random things that doesn't look anything like a monad, right? Um, so can we define monad for that? Well, uh, let's, let's follow our nose and see what happens, right? So we're gonna call this free because I was reading the notes and that's what I called it in my notes. Um, and uh, you know, it's gonna be a monad for some type constructor F. So, all right, that's, that's that. Now, monads, monads take type parameters, right? So all, all monads have some type parameter A that, 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 that is in there. So if we're defining this, well, clearly we need to have some type parameter A because that's the conventional name for these things. Cool. All right, that's the free monad. Um, and uh, so what, what, is actually gonna be, what is actually gonna be in the body here, right? Well, um, an obvious thing that we have to define is flat map, right? Everybody knows that this is kind of the, the fundamental signature that uh, defines what it means to be a monad. Okay, and it's gonna be something like this, right? Um, you know, uh, free of FA, um, add function from A to free of FB to free of FB, right? It's the standard bind signature, right? So, you know, our, our, uh, our monad that we would define here, and we'll, we'll just like do def monad, right? Um, our, our monad would end up being something like, you know, monad of free of F question mark, right? You know, this, would, this is gonna be the type class that we would define. Now, um, if you're not familiar with this syntax right here, this is kind projector. Um, this is one of the type level projects. Um, this is what basically allows us to write partially applied types without using type lambdas. Um, it, it literally just means the type constructor, like of one parameter equal to free partially applied on F, right? It's sort of like, sort of like the underscore syntax for, for function values. Um, it's much, much easier than writing type lambdas because if I had to write a type lambda, it would be like free of F, you know, alpha or something like that, and this is like madness, right? So we're not gonna do that. Um, so free, free of F question mark, right? So that's, that's the monad that we're defining. Um, so uh, flat map is one of the functions that we have to write. We also have to write um, pure, um, which is, okay, given, uh, given an A, we need to uh, produce a free of FA, right? So we need to define that function um, because this is the, you know, this is the, the return function from, from Haskell. This is, you know, what, how we construct a free monad. And we're also going to construct another function which I think is gonna be useful uh, called uh, liftm, uh, which is basically, okay, instead of just given an A, let's say we're given an F of A and we wanna put that we want to put that into a free, right? Because we're defining, you know, we're, we're defining a monad, we're defining a way of getting a monad for any type constructor at all. So it would be sort of useful if we had values that were inside that type constructor, we could just sort of put them in the monad, right? Like that, that seems like a cool thing to do. Um, you know, all of this is just sort of like following our nose, right? So, so let's see, well, how, how are we actually, how are we actually gonna implement this, right? Well, let's, let's start with pure, because that seems like the most, the easiest way to do this, right? Um, and we're, we're gonna have to like define some like 
you know, case class stuff down here, right? So how, how are we going to define pure? Well, um, we're given an A. We have to produce a free of FA. The free has no structure yet. Free is just a sealed, it's apparently a sealed instead of a sealed trait. I don't even know what a sealed is. Um, so we're going to have to define some structure down here. So let's just say, well, let's, let's just define pure, right? Um, let's, let's put this directly into the algebra, right? So extends free FA. Bam. And then uh, right up here, pure of A. Okay? Programming is hard. Um, so, uh, okay, that's, that's cool. We've got one function implemented. Um, what, about, uh, what about lift M? You know, how are we gonna, how are we gonna find this? Because we've got an FA, and we've got, we now have a case in our algebra that, that has an A, but we really, like, we don't know anything about F, right? I mean, just because it's an FA doesn't even mean that there's an A inside of the F. We, 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 don't, we don't have a way of getting an A out of this. So, you know, probably the best thing to do here is just to, like, you know, keep adding cases to our algebra, right? So, you know, FA, FA, it stands free FA. Okay. Um, so far, so good. And then we can, you know, suspend of FA. Cool. Um, that was difficult. Uh, what else? Well, we've got, we've got one function left to write. Um, and that's flat map, okay? So flat map, we have to define flat map up here. Um, so how are we, we going to define this function? Well, we have, so far in our algebra, we have pure, uh, which is just a single value, right? And suspend, which is a value in, some, in, in the type constructor f. Um, how can we define bind? Well, so far we've been following this pattern that looks like with every function that we write, we just put more things in the algebra. So let's put more things in the algebra. Uh, final case class bind f underscore, if I could type, right? Um, e, because I'm, I'm again reading the notes, um, f, fa, right? And then we're going to do like, you know, target uh, is gonna, actually going to be uh, free of f of e, and then some function from e to free of f of a extends free of f of a, and we're going to like wrap this to the next line. Um, okay. Uh, and then flat map up here is just going to be bind this f. We won't save that. Cool. This is the free one ad, guys. That's all. We're done. Um, yeah, the, it's, it's called the free monad because, like, we, we don't actually do anything. Uh, it should be called the lazy monad. Um, so, so <laughs> of course, there's no... There's no actual like meaning to any of this, right? We, we just sort of like built some data. So how do we how do we actually get some meaning out of this, right? So a, a useful thing that we could do, perhaps, is uh, in, in addition to having the ability to take values and take suspensions and put them into uh, into free, and uh, you know, in addition to the ability to have like this this sort of binding of these things together, maybe it might be nice, perhaps, to I don't know, get stuff out of free somehow, uh, you know actually pull data out the other side. And the conventional way that you do this, um, because we don't know anything about F and we don't know anything about A, is uh, through a construct called fold map. Um, and it's called fold map for a couple of reasons that we're not going to get into. Um, but basically the idea is we're going to map our suspension, our F, to something else, to a G. Um, where we know something about the G and can, can sort of move on, right? So the idea is that people, if, if, you, if you have a G that is itself like a monad, um, you can take all of this structure that you have in free and sort of put it into G in the, in the form that G expects it, and then maybe whoever is using this free monad can, can, you know, maybe they understand something about G and they can, they can move on with their lives. So how are we going to do this, right? So G, G I'm going to make the claim, uh, G is a monad. Um, and we're going to take a, uh, a natural transformation function from f to g. Now this is, we're going to pause for a second, and, and we're going to return, by the way, a g of a, right? So we're going to pause for a second and, and explain what this mysterious natural transformation thing is, right? Because I think a lot of us, a lot of us who've done like a ton of scholars that are cats have probably seen this quite a bit, and people who haven't, haven't. So let's, uh, let's actually explain what it is. Um, so a natural transformation is basically exactly like a function, but instead of, uh, instead of operating on values of kind type, so like you know, A to B, that sort of thing, a function on values, this is a function on type constructors, okay? So you'll notice the, the, the syntax is like, well, we're mapping from type constructor F, which itself takes a type parameter, to type constructor G, which itself takes a type parameter, right? So if we were to, if we were to define uh, natural transformation, 
uh, it's going to be uh, literally this, right? So trait uh, that from f to g, uh, def apply a, f, a, f of a to uh, g of a. Okay, that's, that's the natural transformation trait. So it's literally just like, for all f a, give me a g a, okay? So that's what we're defining here, where we're saying, okay, I want, I want a map from f to g, um, and I want to return a g of a, okay? So we're just sort of fiddling things around here. So how do we, can we actually write this function? Well, sort of hilariously, right, we could, we could just sort of like, you know, final, final case cast, case class, you know, fold map, right, and just sort of keep the pattern going. But, you know, I think that's probably getting a little bit excessive, right? So let's actually, let's actually see if we can, like, maybe write some code inside of our free monad, okay? So uh, this match, all right, case uh, pure, all right, pure, we've got an A. Uh, well, can we do anything with this? Well, we're trying to get a G of A, right? Um, and we have, a, we have an arrow, we have a natural transformation from, from F to G, um, but all we have in our hand is an A. Um, but we also have that G is a monad, so um, we, I feel like I screwed something up here somewhere. Let's loop back to this and maybe my memory will jog. Let's do suspend first, F A. All right, so we've got, <laughs> we've got an F of A and we have a natural transformation, which is a function from F A to G of A, right? So we can just say natural transformation F A, and that literally gets us a G of A, and we're done, okay? Um, so let's see. Let's see what else we can do here. Um, pure, I really feel like, now this is where my brain is gonna be weird. Does anybody know what to do here? Mid is monad g.pure a. Yes, it is way too early in the morning and it's Eastern time and that is in fact exactly the right answer. Um, so <laughs> I, would have been in, I would have been in real trouble if this were bind, which is what for some reason I thought I had. Um, yes, g is a monad, which means that g has a function from you know, A to G of A, right? And that function is simply pure. So if we have an A, we can get a G of A because we have a monad for G. Yeah, really easy. Um, uh, do I need to say implicitly? No, I do not. Um, so uh, Seth is pointing out that I'm doing like this wonky syntax thing here. Um, you're gonna see this idiom basically everywhere if you do a lot of like cats or scholars ed. Um, basically monad uh, has a, an apply method on it that takes a type parameter G. And it, it's, it, that's literally the implicitly for monad. Um, all of the type classes in cats and scholars have this idiom. So it's, it just makes it easier to like summon the instance from the ether, right? All right, so monad g pure of a, cool. All right, so thus far we haven't done anything complicated. All right, so bind, okay? Bind maybe seems like it might be hard. So we've got a bind uh, that goes onto a target and it has an f. So how, how are we actually gonna do this, right? So remember target is a free of f e and, and f is like, a function from you know, E to free of F A. And, and we have this natural transformation thing, but how can, we, how can we actually map this into a G? Well, an obvious place to start might be to say, well, target.fold map natural transformation, right? So target, target is this free of F E thing. I mean, this can, this'll get us like a G of E, okay? You know, we're just gonna sort of trivially recurse down here. So we've got a G of E. And we have to map that, and we have a function from E to free of F A. How can we, how can we actually map that into a G of A? Well, uh, we know that G is a monad, so given that it's a monad, that means that we can call flat map on it, um, and you know, get this function here that, that takes an E and you know, maybe does something. And we have to return a G of A inside of here. And we have a free of F A. But fortunately we have this function that we are defining which can map a free of F A into a G of A. So we can just say, um, uh, we can just say uh, take E and uh, you know, apply, apply after that, get a free of, uh, free of F A and then fold map that with our natural transformation, that's gonna return a G of A, which means this whole thing returns a G of A, which means that we're done. And that is the free monad. Um, so this is, and, and the, so the, the funny thing about this function, and it's actually amusing because I like struggled in the middle, right, is, um, you know, there's, there's basically only one way to write this. Like, you're not, you're not gonna be able to go astray. The compiler will just sort of like cut you off and you're, 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 you're stuck, right? Because you, you have to produce a G and you're given an F and you have only one way to get a G and you're trying to get A's and like things like that. They can only come from one place. So there's like, this is a super trivial function. There's only one way to get it. And this is the entire mechanism of the free monad. 
There's a couple of things that we're leaving out here that are like done for JVM reasons, like sometimes you like reassociate the binds and stuff like that in this encoding, but we really don't have to worry about that because fundamentally all that is happening here is we're providing some structure for, for an arbitrary type constructor, some structure that is, is monadic in nature. And this is all the free monad does. It, it's, it's completely trivial. So the question is, if you've got something that's like this trivial, <laughs> What can you even do with it, right? I mean, th this is like, we're just like wrapping some stuff up. There's nothing, there's nothing interesting here. So how can, how can we actually get value out of the fact that we're getting monads for free? Like, what, is, what does that actually mean? And the answer, is, um, the answer is that we can use this to apply um, sequencing and sequentialization to arbitrary data you know, arbitrary algebras, we can provide with the ability to compose sequentially. Um, and that's a lot more useful than it sounds. So, uh, yes? Oh, this is, this is really bad, right? Um, I don't even have like, I don't even have a project set up to compile this. Um, let's, let's just go with the compiler of my brain for the time being, unless, okay, you know what, you know what we're gonna do? All right, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. Um, Let's, let's like make this huge, okay, and we'll like open an Ammonite REPL, um, and then we'll literally just paste this whole thing in here and see if it actually works. Um, it's probably not gonna work. Oh yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, we all, oh yeah, it's, it's probably like, okay, so I have to import like free here and then, uh, okay. Uh, stuff is not found and that seems unfortunate. Oh yeah, so it's, Nobody, yeah, nobody can. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, so I would, I, I would actually need like, you know, import cats.monad. All right, you know what, we're just gonna, Seth, you can compile it as an exercise for the reader. <laughs> How about you just tweet compile errors at me and then we'll see like, see when things go bad. Yeah, so you would need, you would need, you would need like cats.monad or something like that in order to actually make this work because we, we sort of like threw that on there and, and pretended that it existed somewhere. Um, uh, yes, but okay, thank you Sublime. Okay, so um, it, according to the compiler of my brain, this is good. Um, now the, qu the question is, all right, what, what do we do with it, right? What, are, what is the value of this? Thank you, yes? When is NT defined? Great question, this one right here? Let me, let me scroll this up because I know it's like at the bottom of the screen. Okay, yeah, so NT, NT is this parameter. So you can think of this like, like FoldMap is, is it, it's sort of like a higher order function, right? FoldMap is taking a function as its parameter, but instead of this function operating on values, this function is operating on type constructors. And that's what a natural transformation is. Okay, so we're, we're taking that in. Um, now, so what, what, is the actual, what is the actual value in doing this? So, um, what we're gonna do over here is we're gonna kind of replicate like one of the free monad tutorial things because now that we understand what free monad does, which is to say basically nothing, um, it, it should be easier for us to understand like one of these like how do we, how do we apply these things, right? So, so here's the idea. Um, the idea is to allow us to define a, an algebra, so like a you know, sealed trait something, right? Um, that defines a set of operations and then get, sort of imbue those operations with monadic properties of magic um, so that we can compose those operations together and build a program that we can later interpret to something else, okay? It all sounds incredibly wild and crazy because the terminology is strange, but like it's actually, that's actually what we're wanting to do. So let's do this step by step, right? So the algebra that we're gonna build is like, I'm gonna say like disk IO, right? Disk IO is like a very common use case. Usually you're, you're doing something of this, this sort of style, right? Um, and, and a disk IO operation is gonna produce some value of type A, okay? So what is, what is disk IO gonna contain? Okay, so a, a, common, a common thing would be like uh, read, right? Read, read some file, uh, file string, okay? And uh, that's gonna be a disk IO that produces like an array of bytes. Cool, Some, somewhat reasonable idea. Like if we were just defining like a trait with some like abstract methods in this, and in fact, let's actually do this, right? Uh, so trait uncool IO is gonna have like, you know, a read function that takes, you know, a file name and returns an array of byte, okay? And it might have like a write that takes a file name and a contents and like array of byte, 
uh, and you know returns unit because side effects. And uh, you know maybe you know we saw we saw the other day we had a delete, and I think that's like a completely reasonable thing to do, and we'll like return boolean or something, right? Okay. So this this is like the set of operations, right? If you were if you were sort of building like a, a trait that described our set of operations, you would do this. But instead of building a trait, we're just building some data, right? So we've got a read, and we've got a write, uh, contents array array byte, uh, and that's going to be unit, okay? So you see the pattern here, right? Where the parameters to our function are getting put into the case classes, and the return type is gonna be the thing that we put inside the A here. Now, I promise there's a point to all of this, right? There's, like, there's a reason we're encoding it in exactly this way, okay? Um, and then uh, delete, okay? Cool. With me so far? Um, any questions? Cool, all right. So, so this is, so, so we've, built, we've built an algebra of operations um, where we can just kind of like manipulate a disk, but we can't actually compose this algebra together at all. Like you know, we, we, could, we could create a read, you know, high.txt, right? But like we can't, we can't actually do anything with this and we can't even get the values out of it because like there's no, there's no values in here, right? There's no, there's no contents of the file that are gonna magically appear. Um, and we can't build a program that, you know, does a bunch of stuff with the disk because we can't actually like compose these things together, right? We have no way of saying, you know, read this file and then this file, concatenate them together and put them into one file. Like we can't, we can't actually say that. So um, this is where the free monad comes into play. So when we're working with something like uncool IO, foo, right? Cool, uncool, uncool IO, right? You know, we could, you know, we can always do things like, you know, read, read foo.txt and bar.txt, val foo, uh, to val bar, and then, you know, uncool.write, you know, foo plus plus bar, pretending that that actually worked. So, so the question is, you know, how do we, how do we actually do this with our, our sort of very strange case classy style encoding, right? And the answer is with the free monad. So um, foo2, okay, foo2 is going to produce a program of type free of disk IO of A. Uh, free of disk IO of unit, actually, is what we're gonna produce. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use our magical free monad that has no like significant contents of any interest to it um, to give ourselves a monad for the disk IO type constructor, okay? Now we know, we know for a fact that this is gonna work because we just did it, right? Like there's nothing, it, it's not a difficult thing at all. Um, and that will give us a lawful monad and a way of composing together disk IO. So how do we, you know, what, what does that actually do? So we can transfer, we can translate this program up here in terms of this particular, this particular disk IO. So we would say like, you know, foo, it produces to uh, um, disk IO dot read, read of foo.txt, okay? So we're something like this, and then we would wanna have like bar.txt. But this is, this is a little tricky, right? Because like disk io dot read, like this isn't in the free monad yet, so we have to actually do uh, free dot, I think we called it liftm? Yeah, we called it liftm, liftm of, of this thing, right? And free dot liftm of this thing, okay? So now we've got, we've got our foo and our bar, um, and then we'll uh, free dot lift m of disk io dot write. Uh, what did I? Oh, I actually didn't even get it. You know, output dot text something like that, right? Okay, so output dot text uh, foo plus plus bar, right? Um, and then yield thing. Okay, so this is this is like really easy because there's no like again it's not it's not actually doing anything, right? Like we, we, we define this free monad that just sort of like, th this is a common theme, right? We define this free monad that just basically does nothing. It's like completely trivial editor buffer. And then we define this algebra that literally does nothing. And then we put the thing that does nothing into the other thing that does nothing. And then you know, in total, the thing, you know, the program does nothing, right? Um, this is like what functional programming is. You just sort of like compose things together until magic happens sort of and you, you hope it continues working. Um, so, uh, so, so, so great, so we've got a free of disk IO of unit. How, what, what can we actually do with that? Well, the only other function other than like being a monad that we defined on free was this fold map thing, right? Like fold map is literally the only other thing. So how do we, so maybe we can use that to do stuff, okay? And actually I'm gonna, I'm gonna define this as a val because I'm cool, okay? So, um, 
what we, what we need to do to use fold map, right, is we need to be able to map from G, from any G of A, to, or sorry, from any F of A to some G of A. So like any, so, some particular G of A, I don't know, we can pick what it is, where that G is a monad, okay? So um, one, one thing that we could do that seems like it might be useful is um, let's see if we can map to uh, task, right? So we're going to use uh, fs2.task, which is like sort of like an easy task that's hanging out there for cats. Um, so how can we, you know, and, and task is a way of encapsulating I.O. actions, which seems promising, right? Because we're, we're writing this like clearly file system manipulating things, so we're going to have to like have some sort of like file system input stream madness thing that I don't want to live code because I definitely would not be able to compile that. Um, so, so, you know, let's see if we can interpret a task, and, and task is certainly a monad, maybe, maybe there's some usefulness that we can get out of that. So foo2.foldmap, um, and we're going to say interpreter, uh, interpreter, right? Okay, and interpreter is going to be of type uh, disk IO uh, natural transformation to task. Okay, that's, that's the type that we're going to work with here. Okay, so now we do some boilerplate that the Haskell programmers make fun of us for, and then we feel really depressed. Um, def apply, all right, um, fa disk io of a to task of a, okay? So let's see if we can, let's see if we can write this function. fa match, okay? Well, there's only, and I'm going to import, import disk io dot burn, all right? So there's only, there's only a couple of cases here, right? So um, case number one is, is read, okay? Read some file name. And what we have to produce here, like this, this output type, has to be task of, well, apparently this, right? Array.byte. Because remember, we're mapping, we're mapping from type constructor disk IO to type constructor task. Um, so the A stays the same. The A is array byte. So we're trying to produce a, a task of array byte. So how can we do that? Well, this is clearly going to be something like, you know, sort of re <laughs> read, read the file by magic. Um, and then, you know, array one, two, three. I can push the text up, yes. I keep forgetting that, like, the screens are really low because Dustin hates people. So um, it's just hard to, like, see what's going on. All right. Yeah. There we go. Um, all right, so, so read, read reads the file by magic and produces like whatever, whatever bytes are inside of it, okay? Um, write, well write takes a file name and some contents and, and needs to actually write that file out. So again, we're gonna do, do some thing where we have like, you know, file output stream dot, I don't know, uh, write bytes or whatever, whatever the function is, right, contents. You know, you, you, guys, you guys get the idea. Like, stuff, stuff is going to happen inside of here. This is precisely why I'm not compiling it, Seth, because I wouldn't be able to get away with this. Um, all right, and then, you know, delete is going to be like, you know, file, uh, and this is literally just going to be, you know, uh, java.io.file.delete, like, file or something like that. Or, like, I guess it's, like, new Java IO file of file. Dot I don't, I, like, these APIs make no sense. Like, I really don't understand how I spent, like, my half my life programming with these. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> so this is, this is basically what it is, right? So now, now it kind of looks like we're doing real work. And you know we're doing real work because I'm, like, hand-waving my way past it. But we're, we're actually, like, performing some operations, okay? Um, so far, we haven't actually done anything useful with that, but we're, we're clearly performing some operations. Um, and through the magic of, of the free monad, what, what we're doing here, like this, this stuff up here, is going to be connected to this program through this fold map operation. And what we're going to get out the end is a task of unit, which if we run that task, will actually do the work we asked for. In other words, it will, it will read the foo file, assuming that this actually worked, right? It would read the foo file, and then read the bar file, and then would write to the output file, and that's exactly and only what it would do. And, and that is literally just going to work. And, and the cool thing is we can write as many of these, like this interpreter, number one, is like super generic, right? So, you know, it's, we, it's not specific to this program. It literally just performs these operations. And we can write as many of these interpreters as we want, right? So maybe, maybe for testing purposes, Maybe it might be cool to write an interpreter that goes to like, you know, state T of like some, you know, some file, or state, I guess, of like some file system map that's like, you know, string to array, a byte, you know, question mark, I don't know. Um, 
the, so that, uh, you know, instead of actually manipulating the file system, we manipulate things in memory. And we can test our foo program without, you know, without actually, uh, you know, side effecting and trying to read whether or not the files are there. This is really the power of the, uh, of the free monad, and, and it, it gives us a lot, of, a lot of flexibility. The other thing we can do with this is, like, because the free monad has this structure inside of it, right? Like, it's got this, you know, kind of this pure bind and suspend thing, and we can actually kind of look at what the state of things is. We can actually pull it apart and look at it. The program isn't actually running. Um, this gives us the ability to write even more tooling around it, right? So again, if we come back to the example of like the uncool foo, um, you know, this program, this program is code, right? The only data that it exists as is bytecode. So we can't, we can't sit here and introspect it and write tests that are like, well, I, I want to say that the first thing I do is read, and then the second thing I do is read another thing, and then I finally write. Like, you can't really write that test. You can only run the foo function and then see if the files actually got manipulated, right? The free monad is different. Because the free monad, we're not actually running anything, we just have data, like this, this pure and suspend thing, right? So in theory, right, we could write a function, we could write a function that teases apart foo2, and like looks to see, oh, the first thing is a suspend, and then we have like this bind thing that like does another suspend inside of it. And we could actually, we could actually, you know, write some test utilities that do that, right? And this allows us to write programs that are very deeply introspectable in a way that's just completely impossible if you don't use this tool. Which is hilarious because this tool is incredibly trivial, right? Like, I, I, you know, we wrote this and then, you know, it only took 15 minutes of my 45 minute talk and then we were like, well, let's fill time. Because like, there, it's, it's really so straightforward, right? So, so that's extremely cool. Um, and, and there's a lot of stuff that you can do with that. So, uh, are, there any, are there any questions? Of running the task, yeah. Um, that is just uh, to run. Yeah. <laughs> Programming is hard. <laughs> this is. Oh yeah, I should I should scroll up. The um, this is this is something that I find in my career is like as I as I get later in my career, I'm like I just literally can't remember how to do anything anymore. So it's just like I have to do really simple things. Oh, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. Okay, so, so what is task doing? Well, task is itself a free monad, but um, that, that's sort of, sort of neither here nor there. So what task does um, is, and, and I guess maybe people haven't seen it before, so let's actually, let's actually do like real things here, okay? So this is the dangerous part where I'm like, import java.io, you know, like a, like a boss, right? Um, and uh, and we're, we're actually gonna try to do real things. Um, ready, everyone? Okay, so um, this is going to be something like, uh, you know, file input stream, new file input stream, file, I guess, or something like that. Fizz dot read all. I know that's not a function. Please don't tell me that's not a function. <laughs> um, we're going to hope this is like a ray byte, right? Um, and then this is going to have to be in a try catch because Java. Um, oh, God, I'm going to have to like move this out here. This is exactly why I'm a functional programmer. Like I just can't, I can't even do this anymore. Uh, fist tech close. Um, oh, this is totally not gonna work. Uh, yeah, I have to, I have to like catch, right? So, what, whatever. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's. You, you know what I'm doing, okay? I promise. All right, contents, cool. All right, exceptions never happen. Um, so, uh, yeah. In fact, I'm just gonna like double down on this. Exceptions never happen by just like deleting this entirely and like you know completely YOLO. Um, and uh, and that, that totally works. Okay, so this, <laughs> this is what task does. Oh, I just totally screwed up my indentation, didn't I? That's gonna bug me like for the rest of the day. There, all right. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, so what I'm doing with this is um, task gives me the ability to wrap up an arbitrary like action, an arbitrary block of code that's doing evil mutable side effects of something crazy that's really scary and firing the missiles and I don't want to do it like arbitrarily and I want to like be contained, right? So, so I, don't, I don't trust myself to have done this code correctly. I, in fact, I'm basically 100% certain that it's not correct. Um, and, and that the consequences for getting it wrong are quite high because it's actually manipulating the file system. So task gives us an ability to take this scary code and bottle it up and not run it. Um, because ideally you don't run scary code. Um, and, uh, and, and what will happen, so this will give us a, a value of type like task of array of byte, okay? 
and, and you know, we've returned this. So, um, so this task is not, it's a little different than future, right? It's not running. Um, we, we have to explicitly ask for it to run. And it has, you know, all of the flat map goodness that, you know, uh, a, normal, a normal monad would have. Um, and we can sort of put them together in, in sequence as you would expect. Um, but it's, it's, literally just, it's literally just a tool for encapsulating side effects in a, in a reasonable way that doesn't make me go crazy. Ah, well, you know what would be cool is let's write our own task. Um, that, that also seems like, like a cool bit of bonus thing, right? So um, actually, yeah, we're gonna write our own fake task. So instead of, instead of writing task, we're gonna write IO, okay? Because IO is basically the same as task, except it doesn't have support for callbacks. Like asynchronous computation is kind of an important thing. Task handles that, we're not gonna handle that because like we've got like five minutes. So, okay, so how are we gonna, how are we gonna do this, right? So I'm gonna say that um, type IO is going to be a free monad, and it's gonna be a free monad of function to question mark, okay? Now, back to, back to kind projector, all right? Kind projector says that this is like, this, is, this means it's a type constructor that takes one parameter, right? So let's, let's expand this out a little bit. I'm gonna call it thunk. Thunk of A equals arrow to A, right? So uh, IO is simply free of thunk, okay? Now, um, we, we probably want to like have some operations on our, on our IO monad, right? Like, uh, you know, suspend the thingy. Um, you know, we want to, we want to sort of like, uh, let's, let's actually just call it apply, because that, that makes more sense, right? Um, uh, body, right? And you know, this is, this is scary IO action that we want to hide, okay? And it's gonna return an, a, you know, an IO of A, okay? Um, this, is, this is really um, actually going to be pretty easy because um, what we can do is we can take body and wrap it up in a thunk, right? So this, this value here, it's a function, function to A. Um, and then we can use the uh, free.liftm function to suspend that thunk in the free monad, okay? Um, now then the question becomes, okay, so how do I unsafe perform IO is the traditional way that it's called, right? But this is like run, right? So run, run the IO monad. So, um, so given some, you know, IO of A, um, how, do we, how do we run this to produce an A, right? This is, this is super scary function, right? Do, do not do without like gloves and hazmat. Um, so how do we actually do this? So um, the, uh, the way that we do this with IO is we take advantage of the fact that you can actually define a monad for function zero. Okay, because it's, it's just like, func function zero is like, it just has a value inside of it, right? So you can define sequential computation pretty easily on it, because it's just like, you know, sort of run the function zero, take the value out, you know, call the next function zero. Like you just, it's like basically the most trivial monad in existence, right? So, so we're gonna find, we're gonna find a monad for function zero, and we're gonna pretend for the sake of argument that it's already in scope, because my scope is, is, here, import cats, now my, now my scope is magic. Um, so, uh, uh, and I guess probably <laughs> cats, not that. All right, so, um, so, so we have this function zero monad in scope, so we can do io.foldmap to uh, somehow map this to function zero. Well, function zero is already, uh, already in scope, so we're gonna have like, you know, identity, or we're already, we're already in function zero, so we're gonna have like an identity natural transformation, which is gonna be, uh, you know, thunk to thunk, which is obviously gonna be like super trivial, right? So apply, you know, t thunk of a equals t, right, done. Um, and uh, so this, this function right here will return a, uh, you know, a function to, a function zero of A, so we just apply it, and that gets us an A. So the point to that, like the reason we did that is so that we could take these actions and just sort of like sequentialize them, right, without actually running them. We could just put them and suspend them off in this monadic context and sequence them together. Task works exactly like this. So, like basically everything interesting in functional programming, it's actually like super trivial and, and doesn't really do anything under the surface. Um, so that's, that, so task, task's implementation is a little different because it has to do asynchrony, but like you, you get the idea. So, 
I can't remember what my thought process was, but that's cool. Um, so uh, so this, is, this is the Fremont ad. Um, this is how the Fremont ad is implemented. It's literally like three things. So, um, so like super, super straightforward. It's how you use it. Um, so now, if no one has any questions, I will take a crack at explaining why Monad is a monoid in the category of endofunctors. But if anyone has any questions, <laughs> we cannot do that and say that we did. I, oh, I, he feels like I should give lip service to data types a la carte. It's a cool paper, lip service. <laughs> okay, so uh, data types a la carte is a, a paper by, I think, Swystra from like seven years ago or something like that, eight years ago, um, that, that basically introduced this idea of using the free monad, which is an idea that's sort of been bannered around for a while. Um, the idea of using the free monad to do this sort of stuff and also to compose your algebras together, right? Because sometimes, instead of just having disk operations, maybe your program does more than just manipulate the disk. Maybe your program also like manipulates the database and you know, sends off service calls and things like that. So uh, the data types a la carte idea is that you can have this, um, this thing called a coproduct, uh, and, and coproduct kind of has this form. It, that now we're like really, you, you did this, Dustin, like it's your fault. Uh, <laughs> the coproduct kind of has this form, and the idea that you, uh, you can, instead of uh, providing the free monad over disk IO, you could provide the free monad over like coproduct of disk IO of like DB IO of like question mark or something like that, right? And now you, you can put together your two, your two algebras into one thing. Um, this can get like super messy in Scala, but there's, there's ways of making it better that people are working on. Um, but this, this is what allows you to write programs that do more than just talk to one thing, right? Sometimes you want to talk to like many, many things, and that's very useful. It's a cool paper. It's a really, really cool paper, and there's a lot of stuff we're still gleaning from it. Yes? Why am I using task apply instead of delay? Because I have learned that typing on stage is fraught with errors, and apply is five fewer characters than delay. There's, there's no other reason, yes. Dear God, your file system has a million operations? Yeah, so if, if disk I.O. has like a thousand or a million possible things, then you do the Rob Norris thing and you generate it automatically. Um, but you don't, you don't really want to do that, right? So, so Rob, Rob works on a project called Juby, um, which is really, really cool, by the way. But uh, Juby internally has a free monad, uh, has a free algebra that it generates for the java.sql.connection interface. How many here have actually read the java.sql.connection interface? All right. I salute you. <laughs> like, if that is a formidable API. Um, there's like, what, 130 some odd methods on that and all of them have to be case classes. Um, so Rob is lazy and doesn't want to write that by hand, so he auto-generated it. Normally that doesn't happen. Um, and and you, you would have to do that for your interpreter too and it's like a real royal, royal pain, right? Um, you, don't wanna, you don't wanna have to have that. So usually what you do is you do the data types a la carte thing and you kind of split things up into separate algebras that you compose together with coproduct. It, it does suffer from linear explosion. Um, the, the idea is that you would try, so you're, you're generally only gonna have one main interpreter that's gonna be like, you know, something rather to task, and then you're gonna have something for your tests. And right now, the tooling story around tests is not as good as it could be. Um, hopefully, like, Verizon has a project internally that makes it really, really nice that hopefully they'll be able to sourcing at some point, but um, there, there are techniques for making it better. Um, so pattern matching on case classes in Scala is actually faster than you think. Um, like there, there's, certain, there's certain tricks that it can use, but it's still, it's not like as great as it could be. And if, you, if, you, if you're really, really concerned about sort of linear explosion, then you can like pull the hidden tag like ID out of it and like table switch on it and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I, I would assume you're using tricks because you're you. Um, <laughs> any, any other questions? Uh, yes? Is this 
Is this good for anything other than writing tests and having your main interpreter? Um, yes. Uh, so yesterday, uh, there was a talk on recursion schemes um, and, and ways that you can encode sort of recursive data in a, in a sort of a flat fashion with sort of incremental fixed points. Um, because of things in category theory that are cool, um, free gives you, sort of gives you the ability to encode some of these fixed points um, and you can, you can use free in that context. Um, there's other things that you can do with it that are kind of a little weirder that I get, uh, again, still, still exploit the category theoretic thing. And I said that I wasn't going to do the monoid in the category of endofunctors, so we can't. But like, usually, usually in practice, you're going to uh, do most of the, do, do things with, uh, with interpreters and testing, because testing is important. I think, last question, who's going to be the last question? Uh, yes. Anything other than testing that I use the introspectability of the free monad? Um, not, I have not, uh, aside, aside from testing, and, and testing is just, testing is just particularly weird and important, right? Because like you actually need to kind of tease apart the suspension of the, of the computation. Um, you can, uh, retries, um, oh yeah, I guess retries are a good case. Yeah, so if you have a, if you have like, if you're trying to encode an interpreter that, um, you know, it takes a section of the program, like tries a certain thing and it doesn't work, so you just sort of back up and try that section of the program again, right? Because you can actually pull apart and introspect the program and see what's going on, um, you can restructure it in that way. You can encode like continuations and stuff with that too. It's kind of cool. Um, yeah, sorry, we, we can talk later. Um, I don't want to take up more time. Dustin is impatient and uh, I think we're done. Thank you.